Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Jerusalem Fund and the Palestine Center. We're delighted to have all of you with us today, and welcome also to our online audience. My name is Zena Azam, and I'm the executive director here. I'm so pleased to have Dr. Jim Zogby with us today. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Jim. Um, I think all of, of all the individuals in Washington, D.C., who have worked hard and for many decades for Arab American rights and also for civil rights and human rights in general, Jim Zogby has got to be one of the most dedicated activists I know. He's an astute leader, an incisive political analyst, and a tireless advocate for Palestinian rights. Before I go on with uh, talking about uh, what we have coming up, I also want to tell you about an event that's coming up. Uh, we have a new exhibition starting on September 30th. It's called Night Raids, and it's, um, it's basically highlighting the impact that the Israeli army night raids have on Palestinian communities. There will be 16 photographs, and they come from the, the uh, town of Belain, and it's primarily of people standing in their doorways in the West Bank and in this village. And this is a village that was uh, featured in the documentary Five Broken Cameras. Anyway, this is September 30th. I hope you can all come to it. I'd like to digress and say something uh, before I introduce uh, Jim's topic, um, and something put a little lighthearted. Those of you who know me know that I like Jaha tales. Jaha is the wise fool character in Arab culture. And sometimes the stories about him are very funny and sometimes he's really a wise fool. And often he's with his donkey. The story I was thinking about today when I was thinking about uh, Jim Zogby's topic is the time when Jaha was riding his donkey into town and he was riding on it backwards. He was facing the wrong way and the donkey was going straight. And everybody around him kept asking him, why are you riding the donkey backwards? And finally, Jaha looked at them all and he said, because sometimes I like to see where I've been before I look at where I'm going. This is a very wise thing. And I think this is what Jim Zogby is doing today. He'll focus on where we've been. He's going to look at Palestine in the Democratic Party platform of 1988, where we've been, and he's also looking at where we are, where we're going, which is Palestine in the National Democratic um, Convention platform um, of 2016. In both of these presidential election years, the issue of Palestinian rights factored into the internal Democratic Party platform debate. And the issue of Palestinian rights, um, the efforts were led by progressive presidential candidates both times, Jesse Jackson's in 1988 and Bernie Sanders' 2016. And they both galvanized significant multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalitions. So as an appointee by Senator Bernie Sanders to the Democratic Party's platform drafting committee, which the Arab American community was very proud of, Jim brings us a deep and unique insight in the platform to the platform that was formulated earlier this year and how it compares to the platform in 1988. So let me briefly introduce Jim Zogby. He's the founder and president of the Arab American Institute, AAI, a Washington, D.C.-based organization that serves as the political and policy research arm of the Arab American community. Since 1985, he and AAI have led Arab American efforts to secure political empowerment in the United States. He's also the managing director of Zogby Research Services, LLC, specializing in research and communications and undertaking polling across the Arab world. Jim Zogby is the member of the executive committee of the National Democratic National Committee. He's chair, he's co-chair of the party's resolutions committee and chair of its ethnic council. In 2013, President Obama appointed Dr. Zogby to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and reappointed him to a second term in 2015. And since 1992, he has written a weekly column on US politics for the major newspapers of the Arab world titled Washington Watch. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's currently published in 12 Arab and South Asian countries. Dr. Zogby is also the author of Arab Voices, looking at Iran 
and 20 Years After Oslo, among a number of other books and publications. I've asked uh, Dr. Zogby to speak for about 40 minutes, and then afterwards we'll open the floor for questions and discussion. So please join me in welcoming James Zogby. Thank you, Zaina. Uh, I need to this. I, um, usually you conclude a lecture with the lessons learned. Um, I'll tell you what the lesson is from up front. Never invite an old guy to, uh, I do. My dad always used to tell me that he spoke softly because people were more inclined to listen. Um, and my mom would tell me, don't be wrong at the top of your voice. So I, 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 took, I took both to heart. Um, I, I, I was going to say that the, the lesson is never ask an old guy to tell stories because he doesn't know when to stop. Um, I thank you uh, for giving me, though, this opportunity to reflect on some history, uh, some of it personal and, and some of it larger than, than personal. Uh, the 88 and uh, 16 uh, conventions and the platform process were, for me personally, uh, quite um, uh, transformative moments and were very instructive uh, about the political process and about where we were as a community and where the issue is uh, as an issue in our, in our national debate. Um, both shared some common features. Uh, Zaina pointed to one, and that was that there was a Jesse Jackson and a Bernie Sanders, and let's be honest, despite the fact that some of the, the activists in our community were, it was from the grassroots that led this, if it hadn't been for Bernie Sanders, the issue wouldn't have made it at all, and if it hadn't been for Jesse Jackson, the issue wouldn't have been there at the national stage either. It takes a champion to be able to push you to the point where the issue you care about surfaces above the level of, of invisibility. Uh, there also was an empowered Arab community and a community of supporters who were able, once the wave was created, to ride that wave and, and carry it forward. And when, at times, the, the champion um, may have gotten some weak knees, uh, the, the wave was able to carry them as well um, and keep them going. Uh, and then, obviously, the other similarity in the two was that these were the only times that the issue of Palestine was debated on the national stage um, in our history uh, as uh, in American politics. But there were also differences uh, in the two periods and the two conventions. And I want to discuss that a little bit. First, by giving a little of the backdrop to 1988, uh, it was a different time. Um, and a difficult time. Uh, I, um, uh, for me, uh, the story begins with the founding of the Palestine Human Rights Campaign in the late 70s. Uh, when I came to Washington to, to do the Palestine Human Rights Campaign, Amnesty International wouldn't touch a Palestinian case. It was too controversial. They didn't want to lose their supporters. So only Amnesty London touched them. Uh, Sunday Times did a magnificent feature on Israeli torture. No American group that dealt with human rights would pick it up. Uh, we targeted in the beginning and were successful in winning the support of the Methodist Church, the Lutherans, a number of the mainline Protestant churches, but also getting, as we had succeeded in, in doing, all of the major folks who had been in Martin Luther King's circle, with the exception of Andy Young, every one of them joined our board. The only one that didn't was Andy Young because he was at the UN at the time. Um, and we went after and won the support of all of the major leaders in the anti-Vietnam peace movement, including Dave Dellinger and Don Luce, um, and people like Dan Berrigan and Pete Seeger. I mean, all of them, again, joined our our board. Um, we had built a tremendous coalition across the country that was quite substantial. And we were coexisting at the time with a group called Breira that was what Jewish Voice for Peace is today. It was a progressive group of American Jews who were fighting for justice in the Middle East. Their name, Breira, came from the 
reverse of the Zionist slogan, Ein Breira, there is no alternative to say there is an alternative. Uh, and the alternative was peace with justice. Um, we tried in the Palestine Human Rights Campaign to join the Coalition for a New Foreign and Military Policy that was the coalition here in town that included some 60 plus American church and peace organizations. Uh, we were put to a vote. We won the vote 58 to three. Three groups objected and said, if you let the Arabs in, we'll leave uh, and you'll lose all your credibility on the Hill. We were asked to withdraw the application. Uh, we were targeted in ways that uh, were quite harmful and hurtful, including at one point my office was firebombed. Um, and we were called Arab terrorists. We were called PLO, a PLO front group. Uh, we were excluded from me. I was invited to the White House to a meeting with Vice President Mondale. And three days after the meeting, I was called by the White House to say, I'm so sorry, but we can never have you back again because people objected that we had an Arab at the meeting. Um, it was a very difficult time. And it, we learned a lesson back then. There was a kind of a balance between the greater the empowerment, the more the backlash to stifle the empowerment. Um, and so in 1980, when former Senator Jim Aberisk said, let's start the Anti-Discrimination Committee, um, I had not wanted to give up the Palestine Human Rights Campaign, but thought this would grow it and build beyond it uh, and do the one thing that had been missing, which was there was no organized Arab American component. We did it. Um, and Aberisk had star power, and he mobilized the community. He was an, an exciting person to be around. Um, and I did the grunt work of building the, the, the organization. By 1984, we were the largest organization of its kind ever in the country. We had almost 20,000 members, and it was really quite, quite uh, a significant uh, movement. We were very proud of it. At the end of, actually it was in 83, the end of 83, Jesse Jackson came to me and said, would you be my deputy campaign manager? And I said to him, I said, Reverend, for the last four years I've been organizing the Arab Americans. I'm not ready to give it up. He said, you will do more for your community in the next four months than you've done in the last four years. Try it. So um, I did, and he was right. The community got energized in ways I hadn't seen. I mean, it was Jesse's slogan at the time was, our time had come. And it was a slogan directed at the African-American community, but clearly my people felt it as well. There had never been an American political campaign that had included Arab Americans by name. There had been a Lebanese committee for Carter and a Syrian committee for Reagan at one point, um, but there had never been an Arab American committee. Uh, we'd never been called out by name, and Jesse did. He also raised the issue of Palestine. And look, you know, I do not want to be reduced to Palestine, but I do not want to ignore the importance of Palestine for my community. It is a centerpiece of our issue concerns because in some ways it capsulizes, it brings together all of the other concerns that we've had. Um, it's the sense of betrayal. It's the sense of exclusion. It's the sense of denial. Um, it is an issue that resonates for the community. It's interesting when we do our polling um, we poll first, second, third generation Lebanese. We poll. This issue resonates with every sector. You can take a, in the middle of the Lebanon civil war, a third generation Maronite guy who says, I'm not Arab, I'm Maronite, I'm Phoenician. Talk to him about Palestine and he begins to, to, to shake. It's an issue that matters um, because it resonates on so many levels. And so when Jesse raised it, it said to people, this guy cares, he understands. Um, and they joined the campaign. At the end of that campaign, we had a choice to make. And the choice we made was to build on the experience we had in 1984. And so we founded the Arab American Institute to continue that empowerment process and to build on the lessons we'd learned in that campaign. We did voter registration. We mobilized people into the political parties, although the political parties would have none of us. Uh, the Democratic Party wouldn't meet with us for four whole years. They said, why should we meet with you? We'll lose the support of others. And we knew what that meant, and we just continued to do our work. Um, by the time we got to 1987, we were in a very different place. We had done voter registration. We had done voter empowerment. We had built clubs across the country. And we had laid out a strategy for involvement in the campaigns that 
were enabled us to do something else that we'd learned, that you could not only run for delegate, you could not only run for state delegate and be part of a state political process, but you could also bring issues to the state conventions. In 11 state conventions in 1988, we had elected enough delegates and had built a broad enough coalition base that we passed resolutions on Palestinian rights. Had never been done before. It had been done by a couple of groups we discovered in, in 84, in state of Washington, for example, in state of Maine, in state of Vermont, and in Iowa, progressive Jews and some Arab Americans had gotten together and done it. It just made sense. And so when delegates came to the convention and they were confronted with a resolution that said there should be justice for Palestinians and justice and peace for Israelis and Palestinians together, people said, of course, and they passed them. Um, in 88, we had built such, such a momentum, uh, and again with progressive Jews, and again this time with African American supporters, we did it in 11 state conventions. These were the conventions where I actually could do it. In some, like New York, there's no debate. It's just there's no convention. There's a, there's a gathering of whatever, but they don't do resolutions. It's not like Iowa. It's not like Washington. It's not like Illinois, where actually there's a process. And people take politics seriously in those states. Um, it was interesting that the resistance we got was huge. They brought in Tom Daschle in South Dakota to try to defeat it. They brought in Tom Harkin in, um, uh, in, in Iowa. They brought in the, uh, the, the, the leadership in Texas. They, did every, they even tried to move the site of the convention at the last minute without telling delegates to try to get a rump caucus to move forward. They couldn't do it. We passed them in every state that we went into. We didn't lose one. And, um, and it worked. It elevated the issue on the national level. It actually was the Illinois one when African-American elected officials and the Arab Americans there combined, and they brought in the state leadership to try to defeat it. It made a story in the New York Times, which sort of brought the issue out into the forefront. Jesse'd raised it, but here you had a grassroots movement actually winning on it. Um, and in the face of Tom Harkin, overwhelmingly passing it. In the face of Tom Daschle, overwhelmingly passing it. There was simply no way to defeat it because it made sense. We got to the national convention, and the proverbial shit hit the fan. Um, we entered into negotiations over the platform, and if you look at our website, AAI USA, we have the language of all of the party platforms are, are there. In, um, in the language that they had proposed was, we believe the country, uh, main, in, that this country maintaining a special relationship with Israel founded upon mutually shared values and strategic interests should provide new leadership to deliver the promise of peace and security through negotiations that has been held out to Israel and its neighbors by the Camp David Accords. It was just unacceptable. We were in the middle of an intifada. There was a huge crisis in the, in the world over this tragedy that was unfolding in Palestine, and that was the best we were going to do. At one point in the negotiations, I remember, I won't say, I'm old and I don't care, but I do, so I won't say who, but a very prominent Democratic foreign policy leader said to me, you're going to destroy the Democratic Party if you keep doing this, and you will never have a place in this party again. You're done. Um, I said, don't play chicken little with me. The sky's not going to fall. We're going to have a debate. We're going to go home, and everything's going to continue on. Don't blame me if Dukakis loses. It had nothing to do with this issue at all. And frankly, I didn't put the helmet on his head when he got out of the tank, so I couldn't really find. I, plus, if somebody had told me your wife got raped, what would you do? I'd have a different answer than being stumped. Um, in any case, uh, we, we, per, we persisted. We tried in the negotiations t to come up with some fallback language, not wanting to have a total explosion, but we said, just say, and its neighbors by the Camp David Accords, including the legitimate rights of the Palestinians, which is in the Camp David Accords. They said we couldn't put the P word in the platform. Not poop. Uh, it was Palestine. Uh, and they wouldn't accept it. Um, and so we were left with no recourse. But within the campaign, there were also people who were saying, that Jesse, don't do this. It'll be a problem. And there were those in the campaign, some of whom you will know, um, who put real pressure on me to, to stop it and not do it. 
In the end, we had to go to Reverend, and Reverend said, we stick with principle. But then he turned to me and he said, don't blow the party up. And so the compromise solution that we came up with was we would introduce the plank as a minority plank because we had the votes. We had 1,200 votes, and we had them signed on a petition. New York Times, interestingly enough, reported the story, Arabs and Jews fight at Democratic Convention. I said the story actually should have been Jews versus Jews because we had more American Jewish delegates in the Jackson coalition than we had Arab, we only had 55 Arab American delegates actually at the convention and there were many more American Jews. It was a, very, it was a progressive caucus of people committed to an issue um, and we went forward. Introducing the plank, having the debate, having a demonstration on the floor which for me was maybe one of the great moments of my life because I'd grown up in politics. I'd seen the demonstrations on the floor over South Africa, over Vietnam, and I thought, will we ever be able to do that for Palestine? And we did. I just want to show you a news clip that my office found uh, just recently uh, going back then. It was from the evening news. You want to just put it on? One of the Arab American Institute's biggest breakthroughs came in 1988 on the floor of the Democratic Convention. Dr. Zogby. Arab Americans worked hard from the snows of New Hampshire and Iowa all the way to Atlanta to support a resolution supporting Palestinian rights. Mr. Chairman, I'm proud to put forward the Jackson minority plank on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. For the first time, Palestine was mentioned by the Democratic Party. Human rights equal rights and peace. And the deadly silence was broken. We're making history today. Arab American activists won the support of over a thousand delegates and sent a message that American citizens of Arab descent could build coalitions just like anybody else. One of the Arab American Institute's biggest breakthroughs came in 1988 on the floor of the Democratic Convention. Dr. Zagbe. Arab Americans worked hard from the snows of New It was good, but you don't have to see it twice. Um, the, uh, um, it was a heavy time. I mean, looking down over the sea of the convention and seeing those Palestinian shirts and seeing the, the banners and hearing the crowd uh, talking about Palestine was really a great, a great moment. We lost, but we didn't. We actually won a moral victory of having the issue breaking the deadly silence. Um, I. There's a brochure that we printed up back then called Ending the Deadly Silence that quotes some of the Israeli press um, and quotes APEC. Uh, APEC actually did a fundraiser based on the, the event, which I must tell you, we then turned into a fundraiser for us saying, look, at <laughs> APEC is raising money off this. Would you contribute to us? And um, uh, we actually did pretty well. Um, thank you. I should add. One name I will mention because he was so distasteful it was Chuck Schumer. I presented the resolution. Chuck Schumer presented the opposition. Congressman late Merv Dimely then presented the rebuttal, and then uh, Senator Dan Inouye presented the final, uh, the closing argument. Um, Chuck Schumer, the agreement that we'd reached was that we would not engage in personal attacks. Um, and Chuck Schumer got out and said something about the last speaker was disgraceful, dishonest, disingenuous, da, 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 whatever. And people started booing. Booed so much that he got pulled off twice and they had to pound the gavel to get the convention back. After it was over, Schumer comes to the back and he puts his arm around me and he says, Zogby, you have no idea how much money you raised for me in Brooklyn last night. And I was, really? Is that what this was about? Um, but point is, you know, it was, it, we had done it. We had actually been able to, to break through. Um, the last day of the convention, something happened that I, I will never forget. Uh, I was standing there, obviously beaten up um, by the, the, the party leadership, and um, uh, uh, Percy Sutton, who was, had been borough president of Manhattan, 
um, and was a Jackson stalwart. He was chairman of the campaign back then. Uh, and another guy came up to me, and Percy gave me, I don't know if you've ever seen Percy Sutton, he was a bear of a man. He came up and he gave me a hug and like squeezed the air out of me, and he said, he said, this is the most, maybe the most meaningful thing anybody ever said to me about politics. He said, what you did tonight was what we did in 1948 with the issue of civil rights. He said, I know you've been beat up, and I know you're taking it hard, but you just did a breakthrough. And I looked, and the guy standing next to him was crying. It was Ron Brown's dad. And um, Ron Brown, who was, um, I used to call him the go-to guy, because all those years of exclusion, the first day Ron Brown was on the job as the chairman of the DNC after the, the election, he called me, he said, I'm sitting at my desk. I'm not meeting with anybody until you come over here. We're ending this situation. This party's open to Arab Americans. He introduced me to the political director, Paul Tully. Um, he asked me three questions. He said, do you have people? Do you know where they are? And can you organize them? And I said, yes, yes, yes. And I had lists to prove it. And we were in. Um, and so the, it was Jesse who knocked on the door, but it was, it was Ron Brown and Paul Tully who opened the door and, and let us in. Um, a very close friend back then, Jack O'Dell, uh, who had been one of Reverend's chief advisors, said to me, he said, never think you won, because the minute you win and let your guard down, they're coming after you. Um, and that's what happened. But what happened was not just that we got in and then there was an assault on us, um, but there also was a fragmentation within the community because the, the Gulf War divided us, Oslo divided us, and in some cases let our guard down. I mean, the sense was is that, okay, this is happening right now. Um, and the narrative changed. The narrative changed from justice for Palestinians to why aren't the Palestinians doing more? What, is, what, what, what about Israeli security? It became an Israeli security narrative rather than a Palestinian justice narrative, even to the disgraceful point where it is today when groups that call themselves progressive say, uh, we need two states so that Israel can be secure and democratic and Jewish, meaning get rid of all the Arabs, uh, which is what the, it translates to. Um, and that idea... Uh, gelled during that decade, that Arabs were saying no, Israel was saying yes, even though settlements were doubling. Poverty was growing. Freedom of movement denied. There had been 140,000 Palestinians doing day labor jobs in Israel before the during the occupation, after the occupation, and after the massacre in Hebron, when the checkpoints and the border got closed, they lost all those jobs. And so the single biggest employer in the West Bank became the state because there were no more jobs. And because they couldn't import and export, they couldn't grow a domestic economy. And they were crippled. And so it was like blaming the victim for not being able to do more to make peace and make Israelis feel secure. And terrorism, for sure, was an, a hideous uh, blot on the Palestinian landscape. But it does not excuse the behavior of the occupying authorities, the dominant power who denied this freedom of growth, development, and movement of an independent Palestinian entity. Um, and then, you know, the quote-unquote best deal ever that Arafat turned down, uh, and then the second intifada, uh, and then the entire neglect and abuse of the Bush administration of this issue um, resulted in the deformities that we see playing out today and um, changed the political narrative here in, in America, the dominant political narrative here in America. But under the surface, something else was happening. We talk about the, the partisan divide when we do our polling. Well, one thing I became aware of, as we saw during the Clinton administration, you know, what happened was, APAC came out on one side, but ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America, pushed them further to the right. You had a Republican Congress supporting Likud and opposing a Democratic president who was supporting labor. You had a split in the Jewish community that began to emerge. You also had a split in the partisan divide that began to grow bigger. Remember, it had been Bush and Baker who'd been the champions. Now it was Clinton who was the champion. 
He was the one meeting with Arafat. He was the one pushing two states. He was the one pushing, not two states, but pushing Palestinian rights, whatever, and trying to get back at Netanyahu. That divide started and began to grow. And interestingly enough, in the polling that we saw, by the time you get into the, this century, the partisan divide became clearly a demographic divide. And the demographic divide is real. It is millennials. It is quote unquote minorities, African American, Asian American, Latino Americans. And it's educated. It's the educated. Um, and it's the, <laughs> the non-religious. I saw an article the other day that said the Democratic Party is getting less religious, more black, and um, and more atheist. Uh, no, no, and and, uh, and 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 more educated. And I said, oh, so an educated African American atheist is the Democrat. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that those are the trend lines. Those are the tendencies. The groups that lean in that direction. And that's what we see on this issue as well. Um, and. President Obama was the coalition that brought it together. But he brought it together um, without this issue. He spoke rather forthrightly. I mean, he actually said things that maybe no presidential candidate had ever said before about Israel-Palestine. But he said them to Jewish audiences in private. They were leaked out afterwards. Uh, the meeting in Cleveland when he said, you don't have to be pro-Likud to be pro-Israel and settlements. And he went on about that as well. I mean, there's some pretty stunning things that he said back then that had not been said. But again, they weren't public, and they never became part of the campaign. And so as we the issue gelled and we got to the 2008 convention and the 2012 convention, if you look at the language of the 2012 um, platform, um, it was, we support um, two states, because now George Bush had said it, so you could say it. Um, but it was mostly about Israeli security. And then when it said two states, it was to secure Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. And then it had caveats about a demilitarized state. And in other words, it was like, we're not going to, as they, as they said to me this year uh, uh, on the, uh, the other side, they said, we're not going to litigate the issues in the platform. And I said, oh, you don't want to litigate the issues unless you want to litigate the issues. So Jerusalem is off the table, refugees are off the table, this is off the table, that's off the table, we're not going to litigate the issues. So don't talk about settlements and don't talk about occupation. Um, but it was none of it was here. It was it, When Palestinians were talked about at all, it was we will insist that the, any Palestinian partner must recognize Israel's right to exist, reject violence, um, and adhere to existing agreements. True enough, but... One might also want to say the same thing about Israel, but that wasn't in the, in the document. Um, and so it was an Israeli-centric platform. Um, what Bernie did was actually build on the same coalition um, and build it in a, in a, in a different way. Uh, and the, the, the circumstances were different in 2016 because there had been expectations raised by the Obama administration that had been let down. And despite the fact the president did a magnificent job on the economy and a magnificent job in restoring America in so many different ways, there was a sense that greater things could have happened or should have happened and didn't happen. And especially in foreign affairs, um, the expectation level in the Middle East went way up and then dashed to the ground. And only today is resurfacing in part because America's footprint is softer and the less we're there, the more kindly they think of us because we're not screwing up as badly as we were. But at one point, the president said to me when I told him the polling numbers were down, he said, because their expectations were too high. And I said, yeah, but you raised them. You raised them. And so you had a generation of young people who had expectations raised and felt a bit deflated. And here comes Bernie Sanders, who nobody expected. I mean, that this old guy, I mean, I actually loved it when I saw young kids screaming at him. I said, maybe there's a place for us yet, you know? <laughs> it was interesting, when I got involved in the campaign, there were two distinct demographics. There were our guys, the faded, jaded peace movement guys from the 60s, the ponytails and whatever, and uh, um, if they had enough hair to have a ponytail, and the uh, um, uh, and young kids. And I, it was, a, like for me, in many ways, it was a Jackson reunion. There were a lot of folks from the old Jackson campaign who came back. Um, and I 
I actually signed on before. I mean, I'd done a couple briefings for him on ISIS and on Syria, um, and we had a long talk about Israel-Palestine, but I wasn't quite sure it was registering, you know? And then when he was gonna give a speech, and he wasn't gonna do it at APEC, we knew it, and he was gonna do it elsewhere, um, I got a copy of the, the, the draft to work with. I was stunned that he was gonna say this stuff. Didn't believe it, so they said, make some ads. So I made some ads here and there. Still not thinking it was ever going to happen because it was never quite sure it was going to happen. And then he did it. And when he did it, and then in the debate in Brooklyn, doubled down and went even further um, and got cheers for it, it registered with him like Jackson and the wave. This one works. This is where my progressive coalition is on this issue. And so it stuck with him as something that, while it had been an, a sort of an incidental issue, it became something that he embraced and owned. Um, I was frankly surprised when he asked me to join uh, the platform team and thrilled, actually, that you know I was part of what somebody did a cute little video called the Dream Team. And it was, I mean, the, the Native American woman was just remarkable, uh, remarkable. And Bill McKibben is one of the really fine uh, intellects I know. It's, the whole group was just a marvel to work with, including folks on the other side. I mean, it was a great group that got assembled. Um, and we spent days in hearings, and we debated the issues with those who came before us. Uh, it became clear. We thought that, the, that the, the issues would be something else. But when it became apparent to us that the, debate, the dividing line was going to be the words occupation and settlement, I was floored. I could not believe that that was going to be the thing we were going to end up fighting about. And when we saw the draft uh, language, and there was the BDS language, and there was still the Jerusalem language, the one that had gotten booed down on the floor three times in 2012. I was like, oh man, we're going to fight Jerusalem. We're going to fight BDS. I never thought we were going to end up fighting occupation and settlements. I thought that was a no-brainer and a given. But they made that the, the, the issue, uh, and we, um, we, we embraced it. We said, this is what we're going to fight on. Um, we had won in state conventions. Interestingly enough, in some cases, states that we hadn't won before, Colorado was great. I mean, there were states all over the country where the same process happened um, with community folks and with a, a different generation of people, in many cases, not Arab American, not Jewish American, just party activists saying this issue is a Bernie issue. I'm with Bernie. It was a different era in that the issue had sunk deeper into the public consciousness. Bernie awakened it, but it was there and resonated. And if it was Bernie's with Jackson, it was it never penetrated the whole campaign. With Bernie, it penetrated much more widely. It was embraced much more wholeheartedly by Bernie's crowd. I wasn't the odd man out as I'd been in the Jackson campaign. Oh, there's Zogby, he's gonna do the Middle East thing. With Bernie, it was, oh, there's Zogby, he's gonna raise Bernie's issues. Um, and I, because I'd been involved in a range of issues, I did the death penalty, I did the health care one, I did a bunch of them. It wasn't just the one. Um, but this was the one that, that meant a lot to me, to be able to be in a position you know, many years later doing it, doing it again. Um, we lost. We lost the debate. We had a heady debate at the convention. And I think if you get a chance to look back at the videos of it, it was, it was kind of interesting. Um, and one of the things that was interesting was that the light, the art, while Wendy Sherman, who went up against me on the, the, uh, the, the Clinton's, Clinton side, um, had been one of the people, not the person I said who said that awful thing to me, but had been one of the people who'd been on the Dukakis side in 88, um, she acknowledged, she said, you know, we're, Jim and I are back at it again. But it was different this time. It was different because the language had shifted. And if you look at the language of the platform, they attempted to preempt some of our concerns. And my position with the community and with people who care about it is embrace the differences. Understand that progress is made here. And understand that what they said was fundamentally different than what people perceived it to be. It was not a rejection. When the language says, this is the first time in history, I'm going to read from this, I, this is my writing, first time in history that the platform speaks of recognition of Palestinians as having rights 
not as a matter of Israeli self-interest to preserve the Jewish democratic state. The platform says instead, quote, Palestinians should be provided with independence, sovereignty, and dignity. Palestinians should be free to govern themselves in their own viable state in peace and dignity. That had never been said before. They were preempting our objection and our debate by inserting that language. And when I objected to BDS, here's what Wendy said. She said, we're careful, if you read the language, she said, we're very careful not to outright oppose BDS. They only opposed it if it delegitimized Israel. My response was, Israel's delegitimizing itself. We don't have to do that. But the point is, is that this is about occupation and settlements, and BDS is about that, not about delegitimizing Israel. The point is that they were proposing language but in public saying that that language actually didn't quite mean what people interpreted it to mean, that it actually was much less. The threshold of their objection was much lower. Um, we, um, we lost. Uh, we elevated the issue again in a national way. Bernie had been responsible for that. The coalition was deeper. The coalition was more, I think, embracing of the issue. Um, and reflected this millennial movement that has found expression on college campuses all across the country that is not reversible. I mean, they can do all the anti-free speech stuff they want. They can do all the anti-BDS legislation they want. There is a movement among young people for justice that is simply not going to go away. But remembering Jack O'Dell's words, um, this is not a time to sit on one's laurels because you can end up squashing them with your butt if you do. You really have to pay attention to the fact that there is this onslaught attempting to roll back the change that has occurred in the consciousness of young people, in the consciousness of progressives, whether they be black or white or Latino, in the consciousness of labor folks who were central to this debate in many cities, um, uh, and of course, in the consciousness of a network of American Jews that have become as central to this debate, and in some cases, more central to this debate than Arab Americans. And yet we're part of it, of course, but we're not the, we're not the odd man out at this point. This is an issue that's become bigger, and, and yet the rollback can occur. And so the question is, absent a champion, I mean, I'm on the board of Our Revolution. It's great. I'm loving it, endorsing candidates. We won a bunch of elections in Rhode Island and New York yesterday. We're feeling a bit good about it. We've got more progressives that are running around the country. But continuing the movement and focusing it on this issue is going to be the challenge that we face. I don't want to have to wait um, another 28 years uh, for the next convention to raise the issue of Palestine. And I, I want someone who will run the next time, who will say, um, the table's set. This is part of the national discourse. I've got to embrace this issue as part of the package of issues because that's a winning, it's a winning formula uh, for me. Um, I'll end it there uh, and take any questions you might have. You and then you and you. Yeah. Uh, maybe half a year ago, in this room, Max Blumenthal spoke, and he said he was not supporting Jackson because of his inadequate support for Palestinians. Uh, I'm wondering. You mean Sanders? Uh, he's not supporting Sanders, of yeah. course. Obviously, I'm yeah. Saying, yeah, right. O only, only six months, not 28 years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was not supporting Sanders because of that. Well, well, putting that aside. Do you see any hope at all for Hillary Clinton? Let me, let me start with, the, with Max, Max's thing. Uh, I supported Bernie before he did the speech. And I did it because um, I believed he was authentic. Uh, I believed that he was raising a progressive. Uh, look, I, you know, if I ever write a memoir, it's going to be enter stage left. I mean, I came into politics in the anti war and civil rights movements, and I it's, it's not like, I remember one time I did a debate when I was teaching college. Uh, it was on the war in Vietnam, and there was an older guy who was debating a judge. 
and i had been chair of the young republican club in my sophomore year in college and a barry goldwater supporter the long story i'll tell you how i got out of it my it was my mom but i call myself a diaper dam i i mean i grew up from from the beginning that way but it was my youth rebellion right was i'm a republican now independent individualistic I, my message to a lot of Republicans is grow up. It's a kind of a narcissism that it's all about me and my money and whatever. But I, 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 um, I embraced the progressive vision. Uh, it, it's, it, he was calling for things I cared about. When I saw young people responding the way that they responded, uh, I said, this is, this, is the, this is the horse I want to ride. This is the campaign I want to be a part of. When he raised the issue, for me, it was icing on the cake. My commitment to politics is more inclusive than a single issue. Given that, um, whatever one thinks of Hillary Clinton, and there are those who think she's a migraine headache and she's going to be painful for four years or eight years, Donald Trump is a metastasizing cancer. It'll never go away. Uh, the damage that can be done is real, and I'm not willing to bear the price of it. So I think I supported Bernie because he was right on way more issues than just this one. I was pleased he added this one to the mix, although it wasn't always going to be there. And it was it's another story we can tell sometime, Maya, about Maya Berry's with me. She was the person on the actual platform committee that presented the plank uh, at the debates in Orlando. I was on the drafting committee, uh, and Maya was the one who did the other. But given, given that, um, just a quick story about the 68 convention. Um, Julian Bond was the champion on the civil rights side who led the Georgia delegation, uh, the mixed delegation that was trying to unseat the all-white delegation. There was a compromise reached. Um, at the end of it, he was one of the few civil rights leaders who was both civil rights and anti-war. He was championing the plank on, against the war in Vietnam at that convention. And you remember the violence in the streets, but there was also the violence in the convention, which erupted when, having lost the plank on Vietnam, um, the anti-war folks decided to nominate Julian Bond for vice president. He was too young to be vice president, but there were these old white guys back then, they were old to me, standing on chairs chanting, Julian Bond, Julian Bond, and Daly brought the cops in, beat him up. It was disgraceful. The last night of the convention, Humphrey comes out, Muskie comes out, and Julian Bond comes out and holds up their hands. And some of us were devastated, devastated. And I saw Julian a couple years later, and I said to him, why'd you do that? You really devastated us. And he said, there's two kinds of people. There are people who sit on their pedestal and look at the suffering in the world and say, oh, it's got to get worse before it gets better. I'm not getting into the muck. And then there are those who say, it's pretty bad. I've got to get down there and figure out what I'm going to do to make it a little bit better. He said, I can't be with the former group because that condemns too many people to suffer while I live on my purity. He said, it was no longer a choice between Julian Bond and Hubert Humphrey. It was between Hubert Humphrey and Richard Nixon. There was no choice at all. I had to be with Hubert Humphrey. He was the right guy. And that's the way I feel about this election. My candidate didn't win, but my candidate is now running for president on the Democratic ticket because she stands for a whole lot of issues I care about. And I don't know where Donald Trump stands, but what I, I'm afraid of is that what he does stand for and the constituency he's mobilized, which I won't use the language that Hillary Clinton has used, um, scares the living daylights out of me. And that's not the future I want for my country, for my children or my grandchildren. And so there's no choice at all. The choice is clear. It's just, it's. If you care about anything other than yourself, you vote for the coalition. Because politics is more than about individuals. It's about coalitions. And where are, where are our coalitions? As Arab Americans, who are the people who defend us? Who are the civil libertarians? Who are the civil rights activists? Who are the peace activists? Who are the people who defend us when we're assaulted, when, we're, when we face a, a, a backlash? Who are the people who have been with us when we needed somebody to hold us up? And where are they? And I got to be with them. Because if I want them to be with me, I got to be with them. And it's just, it's just that simple. Just that simple. Yeah, back here. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, myself and other uh, members of our team on Arab America, we have been talking to many Palestinians, and they said the single issue, I know you responded to it, that when they vote, Palestine is on their mind. And also that uh, it just they cannot stand the speeches that uh, uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton did at APAC. Yeah. But they, they, we put a survey on our Arab America website, and uh, Hillary Clinton has uh, uh, the most respondents, yeah. uh, almost 40%, yeah. and Donald Trump, 17%. So. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me look. Th th that's the smart choice, and I think that's where most of our community is going to be. Uh, they're not going to vote for for Donald Trump. Uh, the gap's been opening between Democrat and Republican anyway. George Bush did that. As a Democrat, I could thank him. But um, part of, part of me laments the Trump phenomenon. Uh, as a Democrat, I ought to be happy about it, but I'm not because as an American, it worries me a lot. Um, but I, I I will. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm going to vote, and Palestine is going to be on my mind when I vote too. And so too is everything else I care about. But in the mix, the choice I've got, this is not an election between Jill Stein and Donald Trump. It's not. It's just not. And this, you know, quixotic effort to kind of build the third party, build the damn third party. But don't build it on my children's future right now. Anybody who said it didn't make a difference between Gore and Bush, goddamn think about it. It made a big difference, a huge difference. We're still digging ourselves out of the hole, if we ever get out of the hole. And, and so it makes a difference who's there sitting at that desk. Will Hillary do some things I don't care about? Absolutely she will. President Obama did things I, 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 I didn't, I, you know, I thought were wrong. But I also think that don't sell her short. If I were Netanyahu, I'd keep my eye on my back because I could see the tire tracks at some point if, if he gets in the way of what she thinks needs to be done. Um, she's tough. And one of the things about her that I think is impressive is you ever read Richard Ben Kramer's book, The um, um, What It Takes? It's about, uh, look, I got this thing about people who run for president. I saw Jerry Seinfeld on with, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Colbert. And actually, he said it. I, I've been saying it, too. He didn't get it from me. I didn't get it from him. Anybody who runs for president's a little crazy. I mean, it's, it's not. It's like waking up in the morning and thinking, that's what I want to do. It's like this, I, I was going to write the article one time called Democrats and Their Dads. It was all about people who run, who had dysfunctional relationships with their fathers, either abusive, alcoholic, or absent fathers, who were craving attention and whatever and were so obsessed with, you know, you know, being recognized that they do this. Because I've been on the presidential trail with candidates before. It's no human being would subject themselves to this if they had any sanity at all. The one thing I loved about Obama was when I read uh, Dreams of Our Father, Dreams from My Father, I said, this may be the one healthy guy who ever ran because he actually went through therapy right in the book. He dealt with his absent father in a way that Bill Clinton has never been, for five minutes, as introspective as Obama was. Part of Obama's problem is that he is healthy. If he were needier, <laughs> if he were needier, he would have been doing what Clinton and Lyndon Johnson did, which is bringing people over to the White House. Yeah, I mean, I went through these receiving lines with Bill Clinton, 400 people, and with every single person, it was like he knew you all his, all his life. And then he'd leave the event, and you'd have a glow with everybody else in the room, and he'd go to the next event with 400. You've got to be crazy to want to do that. <laughs> but he asked me, six months after I met him the first time, he, I told him a story about my mother. I, I was walking through a receiving line. He said, your mother got any information for me today? It's like, and it was like became a joke with it. He called me the day my mom died. Obama doesn't do that. He's not needy that way. You want your president to be a little needy. Hillary Clinton has what it takes. The fact that she works through pneumonia, I mean, this is a, this is a lady who's tough. And so, I, look, I, I, I've got all my complaints, and I've got a litany of stuff in my book about these are the things, you know, that whatever. But at the end of the day, um, she's the safer bet. 
and i think even on the middle east she's probably a safer bet and so those forty percent are right seventeen percent find out who the hell they are i remember in syria the election was ninety nine percent they were like point three percent voted against the president that was the poll it's difficult to do the poll because I'm sure the pollster had identified the 3.3% so they could take care of them so that the next one was 100%, but that's, that's a different story. I'm sorry, you had, you, yeah, you had some. I'm sorry. And then her and then you. Yeah. While the uh, microphone is going, I just want to invite our online audience to send questions to us. You can tweet, tweet them to at Palestine Center. Or you can follow me on Twitter at JJZ1600. <laughs> <laughs> Got that down? Do you tweet? No? Yes? Sometimes. Follow me, JJZ1600. I gotta build my numbers up a little bit. I don't tweet that much, but I have, I have fun with it. You know, today I just tweeted about Russell Hershorn. Did you ever, you know him, Russell Hershorn? He's running, for He's running for president. Make America sane again. <laughs> a conscious choice for an unconscious nation. I, I, I love it. He ran for mayor back during the Barry years. Hysterical guy. And this time he's saying, don't give your money to me. Give it to a cause. And he's selling Russell on t-shirts. I'm giving you a plug, Russell. Never met him, but, um, and he's given the money to cancer and a whole bunch of other things. Anyway, yes. This is on? Yeah, all right. So my question's more about just generally engaging with people this conversation, just since that's the perspective I bring right now as a college student, where I find that when I'm talking to people in my classes, I can in, be in as honest as I want to be about the, what I feel about this topic, but when I'm talking to people say outside of college, even like outside of the workplace, but just in the older generations, not students, yeah. I've run into issues where even recently I was discussing with people I know who told me that they could not budge on the issue because people in West Bank and Gaza, I don't want to use the word Palestine, they didn't, were being brought up to hate Israel and other and I run into a lot of other racial um, yeah. generalizations I get from Dershowitz. Sure, sure, sure. Sure. So my question is, yeah. with people in the older generation, given that this kind of attitude exists, is it worth engaging in the, to a large man? Is it just more worth trying to focus entirely on the younger generation right now? You know, there's the path of least resistance, which is focusing on the, the crowd you can work with and, and building a political force and moving. There's also the need to engage in, in conversation uh, with those who disagree. Um, and um, you will find that there are times you plant a seed that doesn't grow on the spot, but, but grows, grows later. Um, and there are responses to all those questions. Um, that's what I, when I said about the fact that we were losing the narrative. We were losing the narrative because the Palestinian side has become the, the victim has become the victimizer. The victim has, has been seen now as the, they're more violent, they're more this, they're more that, and the poor Israeli. Did you ever see the movie The Exodus? That's how it got locked in place in the American consciousness. It was actually, it's, it's a little known story that the film, while a Hollywood blockbuster at the time, was also one of the earliest pieces of Israel uh, propaganda. It was a Hezbollah, it was designed as such. And the, the, the plot line was written to create this narrative about the conflict that was at best fictive. And um, it was, they took the cowboy western notion, the, 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 the good guys on the frontier trying to carve out in the wilderness a place where they can live in, in, in freedom, and, and the Indians, the savages, were after them. And it, trans, it transposed that on the Arab-Israeli conflict, where the Arabs became, you know, sort of faceless savages. They had no personality. They weren't, and as I say all the time, that when, when Americans look at the issue, they largely see it through this equation, Israeli humanity versus the Palestinian problem. Palestinians are an abstraction. Israelis are real people. And if you read the Washington Post or New York Times, after a while, you begin to say that, that that's what it is. It's like the story, there'll be a story about Israelis salvaging or saving the Arabian stallion or Israelis, do, there's all these stories about human life in Israel. There's, if an Arab doctor in Cairo gets up in the morning and delivers three babies um, and comes home 
and sits down with his family and blah, 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 blah. That's no story. But if he straps a bomb on, him, on himself and blows it up, then he's a story. Arabs only get in the newspaper when it's violence. You get the sense that that's all they do. That's all they do is kill people. That's all they teach is kill people. But if you look at the daily press summaries, if you the general mission of the PLO does a daily dr press thing, look at the stuff. I mean, there isn't a day that goes by that orchards aren't uprooted in the West Bank or that houses aren't demolished or that kids aren't beaten up or that settlers don't come and torch someplace. I mean, the litany of crimes is astounding. It happens every damn day. Never makes the American newspaper. Never makes the story. And the story is, if, it, if, it, if one Jewish child is killed, it's a story. If 200 Arab kids get killed, Israelis say, well, we dispute that number. And then that's the story. I remember doing a piece when I was at the, the Institute because two events occurred within a matter of days that sort of struck me. One was an Israeli baby, who was I think three months old, was murdered in Hebron by a Palestinian. Um, and the parents violated the ritual practice, which is to bury the child immediately, bury the person immediately after death. And for two days, the father carried the baby and was the front page in the Washington Post, two days running, two days running, um, with interviews with the parents. And, all. and it was a story that should have been told. And this is a father who lost a three-month-old baby. Never should have happened. In that same period, a three-week-old Palestinian baby in Gaza was murdered by an Israeli sniper. Um, it was line seven in a 12-line AP blurb that never made the Washington Post. No one talked to the father or mother. No one, the name of the baby wasn't even known. Didn't have a name, doesn't deserve a name, doesn't need a name, because he's the Palestine problem. And the Israeli, the last line of the story was, the Israeli military are looking into the incident, period. That snuffs it out. Well, they're looking into it, so okay, it's over. Look at how many stories conclude with the Israelis either contest it or they, no one ever, does ever, any reporter ever go back and say, well, you said you were looking into that. What did you find out? Right? That's not, they, they know that part of their propaganda campaign is just say, we're contesting it, and then it, the story's over. That snuffs it out. No one pays attention to it. So there's no wonder that that mindset exists. The point is, is to be armed with individual stories that, contra that contrast with that. And, and the stories aren't just the violence done to Palestinians. But it's the really good stuff that goes on. The Palestinians who are trying to carve out a decent life for themselves, who despite all the difficulties that they face, are not violent and are trying to live a life and bring their kids up. And, and, um, and just one last piece of advice, um, be likable. I learned a long time ago, I mean, one of the reasons why I beat Alan Dershowitz every damn time I debate him, which, which is fun because he, I mean, it, first time I went to debate him at Boston College, he didn't show up, and then he came the next two times at Harvard and again at Boston College, and, uh, and I beat his butt all, all the times, and then we did on TV a couple times, is that he's just not likable. And people would say to me after the show, I watched you last night, you were great. And I'd say, what did I say? And they'd say, I don't know, but you were really good. <laughs> and I learned a long time ago that if people like you, and if you actually, I mean, if Dershowitz gets mad and I'm smiling, I'm the likable guy, which is different than what the Arabs usually do, which is, blah, 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 blah. you know, so you know what the hell he's saying? It's just he's angry, crazy, and I don't want to be in the same room with him. Um, and that's part of the issue. Part of our problem is that we're so damn intense that we don't know how to make the story one that people want to listen to. And if it's a story they want to listen to, they'll listen. Um, don't be wrong at the top of your voice. My mother, no, not you, yes. <laughs> I was wondering whether the fact that Bernie Sanders is Jewish lent credence to his position in your eyes. Uh, I don't think so. I'm Bernie, some people made an issue of it. Bernie didn't, ever. Um, one of the things that struck me was one conversation we did have about something that you know I, I felt really good about was talking about his, his Polish narrative. Um, I chaired the Ethnic Council in the Democratic Party. One of the big issues for us is um, uh, the immigrant story, which doesn't get told enough, uh, and is most of our stories, and is continuing to be the story of America, but we don't talk about it enough. 
And so we, we talked about that and how important that was. And what was interesting is that the Polish community in Chicago fell in love with Bernie Sanders uh, because he talked about his Polish father coming to America. Um, and, um, and so he emphasized that part of the story. It was interesting because um, <laughs> I remember, not, no names, but uh, a, um, uh, uh, back in, right after Tim Kaine got elected governor, a leading Democrat, whose name I will not mention, came to me and said, um, I learned a lesson. Um, we got to talk about religion. Tim Kaine talked about religion, and that's why he was so good he won. He won because he talked about religion. we got to start talking about religion. And uh, so we had a convening of some party leaders and stuff, and the point was, we got to start talking about religion. And this person went out and did a couple speeches, and I went and said, no. Tim Kaine didn't win because he talked about religion. He won because he was authentic, and religion is who he is. And so when he talks about it, it's real. You're not religious, and when you talk about it, it's totally inauthentic, so stop it. Bernie was not a religious person, but he talked about his sense of spirituality, of his connectedness with other people, and it was real. He never, even when, in other words, when the bait was thrown, and other candidates like John Kerry would say, well, I was an altar boy when I was a kid. So every Catholic knows what that means. I was an altar boy when I was a kid, meaning I don't know what I am right now. Um, <laughs> But it didn't come off. Bernie was authentic, and it was real. So when they said, what's your religion? He said, I'm spiritual. And that means that when I look at other people, I see them as connected to me, and we're all part of, we're responsible for each other. It was real. He got cheered for it. Religious people supported him. Non-religious people supported him because he was real. And so I, I, I don't think that the issue, it, there was certainly an, you know, kind of an interesting component to the fact that this was the, the secular Jewish guy who was talking about Palestine. But it was more he was the progressive guy talking about Palestine. And so that, to me, was the issue. I think I got time for one more. One more? Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah. You can write me at jzogby at aaiusa.org. And I'll t my this, assistant goes crazy, but I respond to everything. Assuming yeah. Mrs. Clinton wins, wins big. Uh, perhaps takes the Senate with her and makes some dent in the uh, uh, House for the Dems. Who is our champion on this issue? How do we go forward and how do we make sure it doesn't fall off the radar? I don't know. The answer to that, to tell you the truth, <clears throat> I think that I, 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 I think that Let's, let's make sure she wins. Let's make sure we control the Senate. Uh, let's understand that the obstacles are going to be great. But let's also understand that the dynamic as it currently is is not going to give way to a move or a push toward any resolution of the conflict right now. It's not. This is not when Obama got elected in 2008 where he walks into the White House on the heels of a devastating war in Gaza, on the heels of America in the trash bin of the Middle East, uh, two failed wars that took thousands of lives, trillions of dollars of national treasury, destroyed our reputation, um, and empowered Iran to make it the hegemon in the, in the region. Um, and in the face of all that, he had some mending to do. Um, and the first thing was Mitchell, and then you know went on from there. Um, to Cairo, et cetera. Ends up, unfortunately, with Goldberg, but the, the, that horrific piece in the Atlantic. Uh, but, but that's what he felt. Uh, the dynamic has to shift in the Middle East. And I don't have any reason to believe that it won't. The situation in the West Bank, Gaza, is unsustainable. It just is. And so would she do something on her own? It's like, oh, I think I'll appoint such and such a special envoy to restart the peace talk. As long as Netanyahu's sitting pretty and with impunity and just getting away with murder, he'll do it. And as long as Palestinians are fragmented with no leadership and no coherent strategy and no vision of the future, you know, why bother? There, there's no reason to do anything. It's just, it's just, it, it's, it's reached a debilitating 
destructive status quo. Um, the point is, that what, where's the tipping point? And when it tips tragically one way or another, then we'll see something. But I don't, uh, I don't expect anybody, even if Bernie won, um, nobody would decide, I think I'm going to bring um, Benjamin Netanyahu and Abu Mazen together to have talks. I mean, what, why? One can't control anything, and the other controls everything. You know, it's like it's it's a pointless conversation. So, there has to be some change in the region. Palestinians need unity and a strategy and a vision. They don't have it right now. To be quite blunt about it, um, I'm at the Palestine Center, but it's the tragedy of our moment: is that the the cause we care about um, is lacking vision and and uh, and a strategy to accomplish the vision. And so, till that happens. The, the, ball, the ball is not in their corner to present Israel with a peace offering. The ball is in their corner to figure out what the hell they want to do with themselves and to deal with the... It, 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 look, it's like they're not the first community. But my postdoctoral work was in societies under stress. I dealt with African-American stuff. I dealt with Native American stuff. And uh, we looked at what happens, the internalization of violence and the sort of the fragmentation of the polity. All of that occurs when people are under stress for long periods of time. But at some point, leadership has to emerge that can move that forward and provide a vision and provide a direction and inspire people um, in the way King did, in the way Mandela did, in the way Geronimo did, in the way you know some won, some lost. But, but the point is that they were able to galvanize people. That doesn't exist right now. And, and, and pointing to Israel as the, the, the reason is true. They've made it difficult, but that's not sufficient enough reason to say Palestinians cannot put their house in order, at least enough to inspire their young and give them a direction and a way forward and hope, which they don't have right now. Thank you all very much.